In Revelation chapter 15, start in verse 1, and we'll read verse 1 through 3. Now, I think this is going to be an amazing statement because there is something in the book of Revelation that we've overlooked, we've not talked about, and yet I think it behooves us as New Testament Christians who are under the covenant of God to know exactly what we're expected to do at the end of this age. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, over his image, and over the, his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass. Now, let's stop just for a minute. Let's see what we have here as a setting. Here we have a group of individuals on the sea of glass. These individuals will not be on the earth, but they're going to be on a sea of glass, and then there is seven angels who are going to have the seven last plagues of God. And with these seven last plagues, they're literally going to fill up the wrath of God to pour it out upon the end-time beast system. Revelation chapter 16, the entire chapter, deals with the seven last plagues that will be poured out upon the system. But now look in the last four or five words of verse 2 and then go into verse 3 of Revelation 15. This hundred are these individuals standing on the sea of glass who had received the victory. Notice what they have in their hands. Having the harps of God, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways. You king of kings, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? Here are individuals standing on the sea of glass. They have harps that are given to them by God. They also sing the song of Moses, and they also sing the song of the Lamb. Now, what were those that overcame this beast system singing? All right, I just mentioned it. Two things. Number one, the song of the Lamb and the song of Moses, the servant of God. Now, in Revelation 1, verse 10, this gives the actual time setting for when the entire book of Revelation is to occur. In the first few verses, verses 1, 2, and 3, and so on, it talks about these things must shortly come to pass. And the Greek phraseology shows that once these events, once a specific time has been reached, all of these events will rapidly take place. And in verse 10 of Revelation 1, there's a mistranslation. It says, I was in the Spirit in or on the Lord's day. Now, you could translate the word on four different Greek words or, or four different English words, by, in, on, or at, whichever preposition fits the passage. And it should be, I was in the Spirit in the Lord's day, showing that John was projected forward into the day of the Lord, or the Lord's day. And there's over 30 different prophetic events and scriptures revealing the day of the Lord other than the book of Revelation. So this means that John was projected forward into the end of the age, right before the return of Jesus Christ to show what would take place at that particular time. Now, chapter 15 is after the seventh trump, when the saints are resurrected or changed to a spirit being, they're glorified, they already will be at the sea of glass with Jesus Christ. Those who are alive when the seventh trump sounds will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. So you have both the dead in Christ and those who are alive at the return of Jesus Christ will both be caught up to meet Jesus in the air, and they'll be standing on the sea of glass. Now, they will be singing both songs, the song of Moses, the servant of the Lord, and also the song of the Lamb. Now, let's look at another chapter. Chapter 14 of Revelation, verse 1 through 4. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. 
Now, let's stop just for a minute. Because here in verse 1, it describes very graphically a lamb. And it's capital L, just like in John 1, verse 29, where it says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So we know this is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He is the only Savior of God Almighty. And here he is standing in Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 individuals. Now let's turn to Hebrews, and let's see where Mount Zion is. Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 22 to 24. Hebrews chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 22 to 24. Verse 22, But you are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God. So where is Mount Zion? S-I-O-N, the same way it's spelled in Revelation chapter 14, Verse 1, it is the city of the living God. And what does he say? The heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, or the actual Greek word should be enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. And the perfection will come when they're resurrected from the dead. And notice what else, verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, or the New Testament, and to the blood of sprinkling that, spr that speaks better things than that of Abel. Now, let's analyze this just for a minute. Here in Hebrews 12, we see that Mount Zion is the city of the living God. Heavenly Jerusalem. God the Father is there. Jesus Christ is there. Angels are there and the church of the firstborn are enrolled there presently, and they will be there when Revelation chapter 14 takes place. And when that seventh trump sounds, and this innumerable multitude will stand on Mount Zion, they will be having the harps of God. It says so right here in Revelation 14, verse 2. I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and notice what else we see from this. It says, They sung, as it were, a new song before the throne. Here's 144,000 individuals. They're going to sing a song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they're virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. So they are individuals who follow Jesus Christ. They've been washed with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They've been purchased from all of their sins. They will stand in Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, right before the throne of God. They will have harps in their hands. It says so right here. And it says they are redeemed. So this is someone who understands what redemption is is all about. Now, they're singing a new song before the throne. But let's also now look at Revelation chapter 7. <clears throat> Excuse me. Revelation chapter 7. Start in verse 9 through 17. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all the nations, kindreds, and peoples, and tongues, stood before the throne. Here is a throne. And before the Lamb, this is Jesus Christ, capital L. And they're going to be clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and four beasts. Look here. These, this great multitude of all nations, kindreds, and peoples, and tongues, that's every nationality on earth, are going to stand before the throne of God. It says they're going to be right in the very presence of the beast, and they're going to be right in the very presence of the 24 elders. Notice, the elders and the four beasts, and they fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. And he goes on and describes what they say. 
And then one of the, uh, verse 13, it says, One of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? So John wanted to know, Who are these individuals from every multitude, nation, tongue, and kindred? Where do they come from? Why do they have white robes? Verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, you know, you, elder, you know. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These individuals are going to go through the great tribulation that's going to engulf the world, and they're going to be washed clean by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and they're going to wear white robes showing purity and perfection. Now, verse, verse 15. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sits on the throne shall dwell among them. This is God the Father. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Do we begin to understand? Here is a group of individuals in Revelation chapter 15. They're going to sing the song of the Lamb, and they're also going to sing another song, the song of Moses. There is also, and this group of individuals is going to be made up of 144,000 who are going to be offered as first fruits to God. They're going to have harps. Also, we see there is an innumerable multitude of individuals who have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, these redeemed are going to sing these two songs. And brethren, I think we need to understand exactly where these individuals are going to be before the throne of God. First of all, they're going to sing the song of the Lamb. Now, John was projected forward in time to the very end of the age, and he's going to hear this song being sang by those who are redeemed. And when he's looking in vision, he's going to actually see these individuals in their resurrected state. Of course, they're not resurrected yet because the last trump has not sounded. But when John is looking in vision, it's as if he had already seen these individuals. And that they're already before the throne of God. Let's turn to Revelation 5, verse 9 and 10. And let's see about these individuals. What they're going to be singing. What are they going to sing? Here it is. And they sung a new song saying, You are worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for you was slain and has redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Do we understand that? Here is what they're singing. In verse 10, And has made us unto our gods kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. This is the new song that they're going to sing, the song of the Lamb, that He is worthy to open the book of Revelation because they have been redeemed by the blood of Christ out of all nations. And He, Jesus Christ, has made unto us, unto God the Father, kings and priests, and we're going to rule on the earth. But now, when John is looking forward in time and he sees these individuals standing on the sea of glass, let's take a look for just a moment and let's see what this is going to be like, where they're going to be standing. And then let's get into the second part the Song of Moses, which I want to discuss today, which is going to be very relevant to our ministry in the latter part of the 20th century. In Revelation chapter 4, this was the setting where the 144,000 of Revelation 14 were seen. And those overcomers of Revelation chapter 15, those coming out of the great tribulation of Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 to 17, this is the setting this is what John was projected forward into the day of the Lord after the seventh trump right here, and this is the setting that he sees. Verse 1, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet 
talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I'll show you things which must be hereafter. Verse 2, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So here is a throne, and notice it does say, In heaven. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Notice now, when we saw the 144,000, they were in the very presence of God and the Lamb. They were standing in heaven on Mount Zion. There were four beasts and there were 24 elders. And we saw the identical thing with that innumerable multitude that came through the great tribulation. So here is the setting. The four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Now do we see the very place where these individuals who are redeemed from the earth, the 144,000 as first fruits, they are the first fruit offering to be offered up, then all the innumerable multitude from every tribe, nation on earth that came out of the great tribulation, all of these are going to be on the sea of glass and in front or at the very beginning of the sea of glass you find God's throne and the four beasts that carry his throne full of eyes before and behind. And then we found that there was going to be a innumerable host of angels also where this throne is to be located. This is the setting now where these individuals who have been redeemed from the earth are going to be standing before the God of the universe and before His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, what are they going to be singing? We've already seen the song of the Lamb. They are now being prepared and they'll be at the wedding feast of Jesus Christ. They'll receive their reward just like the song of the, of the Lamb says, that they have been made unto our God kings and priests and shall reign on the earth. But now, what other song did they sing? And they, song the, they sang the song of Moses first. Only afterward did they sing the song of the Lamb. First they sang the song of Moses. Now, what is the song of Moses? And what is the time setting for the song of Moses? Why will these overcomers know this song? And what will it mean to them? And what will it mean to you and me if we're a part of these overcomers? Let's get a complete understanding of the background for this particular song called The Song of Moses, The Servant of God. Turn in the Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31. And let's start reading down in verse 16. Deuteronomy 31, verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, you shall sleep with your fathers, and this people will rise up and go a-whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whether they go to be among them, and will forsake me, and break my covenant which I have made with them. Notice, God knows the end from the beginning. This is the great Yahweh, the Lord God of the Old Testament, the one who became Jesus Christ, our Savior of the New Testament. He is prophesying in advance that immediately after the death of Moses, Israel will begin to turn and to go after other gods, and they'll end up breaking his covenant. Verse 17. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I'll forsake them. And don't we see throughout the history of the Old Testament where God literally divorced Israel? He sent them away. He gave them a written de a decree of divorce, and he sent them away, and he scattered them into the nations of the earth. 
And he said, you won't be my people anymore. And yet he prophesied that a time yet future they would be his people. And I'll forsake them. This is what Yahweh said. And I'll hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them. This is referring to Israel, the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and there were 12 tribes of Israel. One of those tribes was Joseph, who were two half-tribes. So that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us? And notice why they're going to say, Why are all these evils come upon them? Because our God is not among us. Now, we're going to have to identify the time setting for when Israel would go astray and when they would ask this question, Are not all of these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? Well, we're going to do that in just a minute. And I'll surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they have shall have wrought, in that they are turned unto other gods. Notice this. They're going to be turned to other gods, and yet this people is going to be the covenant people of God. Verse 19. Now therefore write you this song for you. So now God is instructing Moses to write a song. And I want you to see what the song is going to be for. And teach it the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me, Yahweh, against the children of Israel. So now we're going to see that God told Moses to write this song. And this song would literally be a witness against the children of Israel when they go a whoring after other gods. When they turn after other gods, they turn away from the ways of this Bible that's revealed unto Moses by Yahweh who became Jesus Christ. They'll go after other gods. Now, let's notice something else. For when I shall have brought them into the land, which I swear unto their fathers, that flowed with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves and waxen fat. Then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. Here is a prophecy that immediately after Moses died, the children of Israel would go into the land which God had given them. He had promised it to them. He brought them out of Egypt. He delivered them from slavery. He was the savior of physical Israel. And when they would go into the land, they would have every good thing. And when they had accumulated wealth, plenty of food, they were out of danger of their enemies. Then they would provoke God by breaking his covenant. And it shall come to pass, verse 21, when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song shall testify against them as a witness. This is very important that we understand this song was written in the pages of the Bible to be a witness against someone. It's going to be against someone, and they are going to be Israel, but when is it going to be a testimony against them? When is it going to be a witness against them that they have forgotten their God? Let's get down and see. For it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of your seed. For I know their imagination which they go about. Even now, before I've brought them into the land, which I swear. Verse 22. Moses, therefore, wrote this song the same day and taught it the children of Israel. And he gave Joshua, the son of Nun, a charge and said, Be strong and of a good courage, for you shall bring the children of Israel into the land, which I swear unto you, and I will be with you. This is God. <clears throat> God was going to be with Joshua after Moses' death. Now, look at verse 24. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against you. 
Notice what's happening now. God has already given a song which Moses wrote. He taught it to the people. They memorized it so they could sing it. And he said it would be a witness against Israel because they would go whoring after other gods. They would break his covenant. And now he had Moses to write down all the covenant, the law of God, in a book of the covenant. And they put it in the ark. And God said that this covenant, this book of the covenant, or the book of the law, would also be a witness against Israel. Verse 27, For I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you, this is Moses talking, this day you've been rebellious against the Lord, and how much more after my death. Now, let's stop here just for a minute. <clears throat> We're going to see that there are now going to be two witnesses against Israel. Two witnesses. One of them is going to be the Song of Moses. And those who are standing on the sea of glass are going to sing this Song of Moses first. And then secondly, there is another witness against the people. There is a witness against Israel, and it's the law, the book of the law, which is the covenant of God. Now, verse 28 to 30. Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days. Brethren, what is the time setting for this song of Moses? What is the time setting for these two witnesses against Israel? It's the latter days. Because you'll do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of the song until they were ended. Now, these two witnesses, God's law and the song of Moses, were to be against Israel in the latter days, the 20th century, today. So God's law literally calls for two or more witnesses to declare someone guilty in capital punishment. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6 and 7. Deuteronomy 17, verse 6 and 7. At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. The hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people. So you shall put evil away from among you. So the law of witnesses in the Bible, in Deuteronomy 17, 6 and 7, says that God must have two witnesses against, e against Israel for their evil. And here they are. Number one is God's law. And the second one is the song of Moses. Now, let's get into the song of Moses itself. I only want to go, I'm only going to touch on a couple of items before we read it from one end to the other. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, and this chapter is the chapter of the Song of Moses, verse 3 and 4, Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe you greatness unto our God. Now, notice verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is He. So here is a God. He is called the Rock. This is a God that's called the Rock. Now this is very important that we understand this. Because in the latter days, here is someone who is going to be trusting in the Rock they're going to be publishing his name, the name of Yahweh, ascribing greatness unto our God, and he's going to be the rock. Now, let's look in verse 15, the latter part. 
Then he forsook God, which made him, this is Israel, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Notice the capital R. Here are people in the latter days, they're going to be called Israel, and they're going to lightly esteem the rock of their salvation. Who is the Savior of Israel? So in the latter days, they're literally going to forsake Israel. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers, and he's talking to Israelites here, and now those who have accepted Jesus Christ of other nations have accepted all of God's laws. They were circumcised in heart, Romans 2, verse 25 to 28. They accepted Israel's Savior. Now they are a part of Israel. And Paul says he does not want them to be ignorant how that all of our fathers were, past, or were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, referring to the Red Sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So when they went through those parted waters on each side of the Red Sea, they went through the middle of those parted waters. They were literally baptized as a symbolic thing, as a whole nation unto God. Verse 3, talking to Israel, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock, capital R, O C K, was Christ. Jesus Christ was the rock that led Israel. So now, what I want us to notice is this literally identifies right here in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4, who the rock was that Israel in the last days rejected. So here are a group of individuals who must have accepted Jesus Christ. They must have. And then they end up in the 20th century, the latter days, before the seventh trump, while they're still living in the flesh, and yet they accepted their Savior, and they esteemed Him very lightly. Now let's turn to Genesis chapter 48. Genesis chapter 48. Because there were individuals, there were 12 tribes of Israel at one time. They were all together in the land of Palestine. Verse 16. And the angel which redeemed me, this is Jacob talking, whose name was changed to Israel, he redeemed me from all evil. Bless the lads. He's referring to Joseph, who was one of the twelve sons of Israel. His two brothers, or his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And let my name be named on them. So here was Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Israel placed his name, Israel, upon these two sons. They were to be called Israel from then on and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth and when you look down into verse 17 he said that his father refused to, to switch their hands because the oldest son was to have the right hand placed upon his head for a blessing and yet he switched it and he put it on Ephraim's head so the youngest son would have the greatest blessing and his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. So here was one of the brothers of Joseph that was to become a multitude of nations. And the other brother was to become the greatest nation that ever walked on the face of the earth. The greatest individual nation that ever existed. And these two talk alike, walk alike, act alike, same customs, same traditions, going after the same God, basically. They were to be called Israel. Now look in chapter 49. This will identify the prophecy of this entire chapter, what the twelve sons of Israel would be like in the last days. And then we're going to identify who it is 
that God Almighty said would turn their back upon Jesus Christ, the rock in the latter days. Chapter 49 of Genesis, verse 1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. The last days. And then he starts describing each one of the sons. Now notice verse 22 to 26. We now drop down to Joseph. We saw that old Jacob laying on his bed crossed his hands and blessed Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. He said, one of them have a commonwealth of nations, many nations, a company of nations. He said it would be a multitude of nations, while the other would be the greatest nation on earth. And it would be in the last days. Verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bough. When you're fruitful, that means you have a large number of individuals. Either you have a lot of individuals or else you have a great deal of wealth. Even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. And isn't it true in the last days today, international communism and socialism are striking to destroy one group of people, that is the United States of America and the British Commonwealth of Nations. Canada, Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and all of those commonwealth countries which Great Britain controls. Verse 24, But his bow, this is Joseph, abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And so these individuals, Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, they were made strong militarily, economically, by the hands of God Almighty, the mighty God of Jacob. And who was the God of Jacob? Yahweh, who became the Savior and Redeemer of Israel. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Now, that's very interesting because who is the shepherd of Israel? Hebrews chapter 13 will give us an indication as to who it is. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. Here's what it says. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. And what did it say right here in Genesis chapter 49, verse 24? From thence, this God of Jacob is the shepherd. And who is the shepherd? It says Jesus Christ, that great shepherd. Jesus. This is the one who is upholding the hands of Joseph the United States of America and the British Commonwealth in the 20th century. And it says, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So Jesus is the one who came and died for the sins of individuals. He shed the blood of the everlasting covenant. For those who have broken that covenant, they accept the shed blood of Jesus, then they start living by that covenant. So we can identify for a surety who it is that is referred to that the Song of Moses is for in the 20th century if we can identify who it is that is a nation of individuals were based upon God and His laws. But also, it says here in Genesis chapter 49, 24, the stone of Israel. Now, who is the stone? We've already identified it said Jesus Christ was the shepherd, the great shepherd. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 to 8, it will identify once again who the stone is. Referring to Jesus Christ, said, You also, as lively stones, are built upon a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also, notice he's talking about Jesus Christ here, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief, corner stone elect precious and he that believes on him this chief corner stone shall not be confounded unto you therefore which believe he is precious but unto them that be disobedient 
the stone which the builders disallowed the same is made the head of the corner. And who was it that was killed and not accepted as the king and ruler of Israel? The Jews killed Jesus Christ, the great Yahweh, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Verse 8, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. So truly, this stone and this rock is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of the living God. And it's Israel in the latter days or the last days will be followers of the rock. And it's going to be Joseph, the descendants of the tribe of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, that were followers of the rock, and they would be held up by the mighty arm of the God of Jacob, who is Jesus Christ, the rock. Now, Jesus sent his 12 apostles to Israel. In, in Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. <clears throat> verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter you not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So here we have it. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So here were the twelve apostles to go to those of the dispersion who were sent into national captivity 130 years before the house of Judah even went into the Babylonian captivity. They were lost, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> they were lost from sight. They were out of view of the masses of this world. No one knew exactly where the 12 tribes of Israel were, and yet Jesus Christ of Nazareth sent the 12 apostles to the tribes of Israel to preach the kingdom of God to them. And they accepted it. And it was to be mainly to Joseph who was to be upheld by the mighty hands of the God of Israel. I want, to know, I want you to see now that those who lived in Palestine of that day actually understood that the twelve or the ten tribes of lost Israel, the house of Israel, was scattered. They were in what was called the dispersion. And yet, those in the Middle East at that time when Jesus was born were called Jews, some of them from the tribe of Judah. Some of them had intermarried among the races there in that day. Some of them had, and the Pharisees had come out of the Babylonian captivity and they were upholding the traditions of the elders, the Babylonian Talmud. They were not obeying the Word of God anymore. Now, notice what was said in John chapter 7, verse 34 and 35. So they knew that Israel was not in Palestine. Verse 33. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. So he would go back to God the Father. But notice what he said. You'll seek me, and shall not find me. And where I am, thither you cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Where will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? So here the Jews in Palestine knew the northern ten tribes of Israel and all the cities except Jerusalem had already gone into national captivity 130 years before the Babylonian captivity. He knew they were dispersed among the nations. And Jesus said that he was sending the twelve apostles to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Lost Israel, that means Joseph. Because when ancient Jacob placed his hands upon Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, he said, let my name Israel be named upon them. So these were the two leading nations of all the ten lost tribes of Israel. They were the leaders of all others. To be exact, they were the ones who were supposed to have received the greatest wealth of all other nations on earth, of the Israelite nations. I want to read that to you in First Chronicles chapter 5, 
verse 2. It was Joseph who was the oldest son of one of the wives of Jacob. And because Judah, or because Reuben, who was the oldest of his first wife, defiled his own bed, he had sexual intercourse with his own mother, therefore he was disqualified from receiving the birthright, which was a double portion of wealth over all the other tribes of Israel. Then in verse 2 for, of First Chronicles chapter 5, For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, but the birthright was Joseph's. So the birthright of fantastic blessings was to be Joseph's. It was to be at the end of the age. So here were people identified in this song of, uh, song of Moses who were to accept the rock, Jesus Christ, as their Redeemer and Savior. They were to be the most wealthy people on the face of the earth. They were to be upheld militarily, economically, and so on by Jesus Christ, the mighty God of Jacob. Can there be any doubt that this prophecy in the Song of Moses was for the latter days? It was after Jesus Christ had already come to offer salvation. Otherwise, how could these individuals have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior? Jesus sent the twelve apostles to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They were dispersed. They had gone an overland trout, uh, route up by the Black and Caspian Sea, up into Russia, the great plains of Russia, then migrated westward across Europe. They came down into Italy and they helped to sack Rome. And then they went on a cross and they settled such countries as France, England, Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland, Norway, Finland. And then at a later time, they came on a cross into the United States of America. I want to show you one other thing right quick. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 1 to 6. Revelation chapter 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with a sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And we're going to see who this is. It is physical, fleshly Israel. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Who is going to be delivered? Who is this child? And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. This is Satan. Revelation 12, 9 says it is. Having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, so it identifies Satan as the very backbone of all world-ruling governments from the time of Babylon all the way down into the very end of the age, the last one to arise just around the corner. Verse 4, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, so that's a third of the angels, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, so this child was to be delivered from this woman, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Who is this child? Verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Israel was to have a ch man-child, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who was to be offered for the sins of the world. Then he was to sit down at the right hand of the Father and wait until the time of the restitution of all things. And once this restitution takes place, then he is to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And her child, so this is Israel, physical fleshly Israel, was caught up unto God into his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of, of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So here was physical fleshly Israel, Jesus Christ born through Israel. Jesus was sacrificed. Satan was going to destroy Jesus, who was the hope of the world. No one would receive salvation unless Jesus Christ died for their sins. And so Jesus died. He was resurrected from the dead. That's a part of the good news that we can be reconciled to Jesus. This was what was preached when the apostles went to the lost house of Israel. They went and preached 
that now the kingdom of God is close. It's at hand. They can now repent of all their sins, be reconciled to God the Father through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They can have all their sins for violation of the first covenant. Hebrews 9, 14 and 15. And then Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. The blood of the everlasting covenant had been shed. They can be reconciled back to God. They can prepare to be kings and priests in that kingdom when it comes to this earth and when it's established. Now, let's go back to Deuteronomy to this Song of Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 32. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 32. And let's look at verse 10. And this is talking about Israel once again. In the previous verse, verse 9, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Talking about Yahweh or Jesus Christ's inheritance. He found him in a desert land, in the waste, howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Now, remember we saw in chapter 31, verse 29, the time setting for the Song of Moses was to be at the, in the latter days. Right at the very end of the age, Israel would find themselves in trouble and they would discover that their God was not among them. And this was the reason why they were in trouble. Now he's going to identify the place where lost Israel can be found in the latter days. It says he found him in a desert land. Now, when you look up the word desert in the concordance, it literally means the, the Bible usage is not as it's used today, like a desert where there's nothing but sand. Rather, it's wilderness or a deserted place. It's a place where few inhabitants are. And Cruden's complete concordance will explain all of that for you. It's literally a deserted place. Now, there is only one nation on earth today that was a wilderness place or deserted place which when colonized had as its only God, God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. That was the United States of America. Now, I want to read to you some documentation that will begin to lend to that. I want to quote one of the presidents of the United States of America, Mr. Woodrow Wilson. Here's what he said. A nation, nation which does not remember what it was yesterday does not know what it is today, nor what it is trying to do. We are trying to do a futile thing if we do not know where we came from or what we have been about and I want to tell the people of the United States of America that unless we understand where our roots are from, why we are in this great land, why we have taken 95 to 98 percent of all Bibles in the world from the British Commonwealth and the United States of America into all nations of the earth, if we don't understand where our roots came from, then we have no purpose any longer. And we're going to be dissolved as a nation just like the Roman Empire. When they had no more purpose, they were destroyed. And the United States of America is right now on the very brink of disaster. Now, I want to read to you the Mayflower Compact. Here it is. When the first fledgling ship, the Mayflower, was about to be landed, they sat down and they wrote something in 1620. Here's what William Bradford said concerning that. Or, I'm sorry, I'll read that in just a minute. There were 41 separatists who represented one branch of the evangelical Puritan movement which would build America. They literally made a covenant with God and each other, and they were bound as a colony for the glory of God. Look what it says, and this was written on November 11th, 1620. In the name of God, amen. The roots of America is God. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God. Notice in the very founding documents, the Mayflower Compact, they said God 
ruled everything. So, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, having undertaken, what did they undertake? Why did they come to America? For the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. That's why they came to America. And the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combined ourselves together into a civil body politic. They made the first laws, civil government, and it was all based upon the advancement of the faith, Christian religion, and God Almighty was the king of it. These are our roots. And when we don't allow God Almighty and Jesus Christ in our schools and our halls of Congress anymore, God is going to desert our nation and we're going to go under and our roots will be forgotten. For our better ordering and preservations and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof do and act, constitute and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience, in witness here, whereof we have here, hereunto ascribed our names at Cape Cod the 11th of November in the reign of our King Sovereign, Lord J King James, of England, France, and Ireland, the 18th, and of Scotland, the 54th, Anno Domino, 1620. So you see, in the very founding documents of Mayflower Compact, this colony of Virginia that they originally set out for was to be for the advancement of the kingdom of God, and it was for the Christian religion. Now I want to show you what historian William Bradford describing the first landing of the Mayflower at Plymouth Rock on Dece in December. Here's the words he wrote, I quote, Being thus arrived in a good harbor and brought safe to land, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean and delivered them from the perils and miseries thereof, again to set their feet on the firm and stable earth their proper element beside, besides what could they see but a hideous and desolate wilderness. And what, where was God going to find Israel in the latter days when the song of Moses was to be told to them as a witness that they had forsaken their God? It was to be in a deserted area, a deserted place, a wilderness, full of wild beasts and wild men. And what multitudes there might be of them they knew not. What could now sustain them, these colonists, but the Spirit of God and His grace? This is the founding documents of the United States of America. The people who came here and settled the United States of America said that it was based upon God Almighty and that it was based upon the furtherance of the Christian religion. It was not secular humanism. It was not to dismantle God from our constitutional halls. It was not to take God out of our classrooms. But it was to put God and Jesus Christ first and foremost. And as long as we did that, would be the greatest nation on the face of the earth. Now, also, from a book called The Rebirth of America, page 21, it quotes the Supreme Court decision of 1892, the Church of Holy, the Holy Trinity versus the United States. Look what it says. Our laws and our institutions must necessarily be based upon and embody the teachings of the Redeemer of mankind. That's Jesus, my friends. This nation, the Supreme Court in 1892, said all of our laws and institutions are based upon the Redeemer of mankind, Jesus Christ. It is impossible that it should be otherwise. And in this sense, and to this extent, our civilization and our institutions are emphatically Christian. Not atheistic, not secular, not Eastern mystical religions, but Christian. There should be no one in this country that's not a Christian. Now I'll continue what the court decision was. 
This is a religious people. This is historically true. From the discovery of this continent to the present hour, which was 1892, there is a single voice making this affirmation. We find everywhere a clear recognition of the same truth. These and many other matters which might be noticed add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances that this is a Christian nation. Do we understand where our roots come from in the United States of America? Either we understand where our roots come from or we are going to be destroyed. It's that simple. Now, from this same book, The Rebirth of America, I'll read to you evidences of our Christian heritage. In the summer of 1787, representatives met in Philadelphia to write the Constitution of the United States. After they'd struggled for several weeks and had made little or no progress, 81-year-old Benjamin Franklin rose and addressed the troubled and disagreeing convention that was about to adjourn in just utter chaos and confusion. He stated, and I quote, In the beginning of the contest with Britain, when we were sensible to danger, we had daily prayers in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard and they were graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. Have we now forgotten this powerful friend referring to God? Or do we imagine we no longer need His assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of man. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings, that's the Bible, that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven, that's God Almighty and Jesus Christ, and its blessings on our deliberation be held in this assembly every morning. End of quote. The very purpose of the pilgrims in 1620 was to establish a government based upon the Bible. The New England Charter signed by King James I confirmed this goal. I quote from it, to advance the enlargement of the Christian religion to the glory of God Almighty, end of quote. Governor Bradford, in writing, which I've already quoted from, of the Pilgrim's Landing, describes their very first act, quote, being thus arrived in a good harbor and brought safe to land, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven, end of quote. Can there be any doubt the goal of government based on Scripture was further reaffirmed by individual colonies such as the Rhode Island Charter in 1683. I'll quote, We submit our persons, lives, and estates unto our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and to all those perfect and most absolute laws of His given us in His holy word. End of quote. Those absolute laws became the basis of our Declaration of Independence, which includes in its first paragraph an appeal to the laws of nature and of nature's God. Our national constitution established a republic upon the absolute laws of the Bible, not a democracy based upon the changing whims of people. 51% vote changes laws. No, our republic was based upon the absolute laws of God which never change. And yet they've been changed now, our constitutional republic, into a democracy. In his inaugural address before Congress, the first president of our nation, George Washington, stressed God's role in the birth of this republic. I quote, No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand 
which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. Every step by which they have advanced to the character of an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency. We ought to be no less persuaded that the propitious smiles of heaven cannot be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right, which heaven itself has ordained. End of quote. One of George Washington's early official acts was the first Thanksgiving proclamation, which reads, and I quote, Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly implore His protection and favor. End of quote. It goes on to call the nation to be thankful to Almighty God and to His Son, Jesus Christ. Continuing through the decades of history, we find in the inaugural addresses of all the presidents and in the Constitution of all 50 of our states, without exception, references to Almighty God of the universe, the author and sustainer of our liberty. The principles of God's Word guided the decisions of which this nation built its foundation. This was the discovery of a Mr. Alex de Tocqueville, the, French, the noted French political uh, philosopher of the 19th century. He visited America in her infancy when she was just born as a nation to find the secret of why she was so great. And as he traveled from town to town, from city to city, from state to state, he talked with people and asked questions. He examined our young national government, our schools. He examined the centers of business but could not find in them the reason for our strength. Not until he visited the churches of America and he witnessed the pulpits of this land, which he said, quote, were aflame with righteousness, end of quote, did he begin to find the secret of our greatness. Returning to France, he summarized his findings, and I quote, America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. End of quote. Throughout our history, our forefathers have given eloquent testimony of our commitment to God and His principles. Listen to Abraham Lincoln. Quote, it is the duty of nations as well as of men to owe their independence or their dependence upon the overruling power of God and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by his by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. End of quote. Noah Webster, quote, The religion which has introduced civil liberty is the religion of Christ and His apostles. To this we owe our free constitutions of government. End of quote. Mr. Noah Webster also said, The moral principles and precepts contained in the scriptures ought to form the basis of all our civil constitutions and laws. All the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. End of quote. I want to give just a few more quotes from presidents of the United States because I want us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are a nation under God. This nation originally founded was to be a Christian nation it was discovered, it was had its people implanted here with one goal in mind, and that is that this was to be a Christian nation. It was to further the advance of God Almighty on this earth, to uphold Jesus Christ as the Redeemer of all mankind. Here's what John Quincy Adams says, I quote, The first and almost the only book deserving of universal attention is the Bible, 
End of quote. Abraham Lincoln. All the good from the Savior of the world is communicated through this book. But for the book, we could not know right from wrong. All the things desirable to man are contained in it. End of quote. Abraham Lincoln knew that everything in the entirety of the Bible was for our good. For our good. Woodrow Wilson said, The Bible is the one supreme source of revolution of the or revelation of the meaning of life, the nature of God and spiritual nature and need of men. It is the only guide of life which really leads the spirit in the way of peace and salvation. End of quote. Andrew Jackson, go to the scriptures. The joyful promises it contains will be a balm to all your troubles. End of quote. Mr. Calvin Coolidge, the foundations of our society and our government rest so much on the teachings of the Bible that it would be difficult to support them if faith in these teachings would cease to be practically universal in our country. End of quote. This is the problem in America today. We have forgotten our God. In the 20th century, it was prophesied that if we would forgot our God, all these evils that we see in America today, crime, violence, foreigners bringing in their gods into a land that was, it was established by Christians for the furtherance of the Christian religion and for God Almighty, not for paganism, not for secular humanism, all the crime, the violence would cease in America if we would return to a Christian nation. There was a time in our history when America, the United States of America, literally cried for Bibles. The American Revolution was in full swing. The Bible, through more than 150 years of early settlement in America, remained the base of her people's religious devotion, her education, her colonial government. These Bibles had been shipped in from England. Now suddenly, the American Revolution cut off this supply of Bibles, and the stock of Bibles began to dwindle. Here was America in its greatest crisis yet without Bibles. Patrick Allison, who was chaplain of Congress, placed before that body in 1777 a petition praying for immediately immediate relief. It was assigned to a special committee which weighed the matter with great care and reported, and I quote, that the use of the Bible is so universal and its importance so great that your committee refer the above to the consideration of Congress. And if Congress shall not think it expedient to order the importation of types and paper, the committee recommend that Congress will order the committee of Congress to import 20,000 Bibles from Holland, Scotland, or elsewhere into the different parts of the states of the Union, whereupon it was resolved accordingly to direct said committee to import 20,000 copies of the Bible. End of quote. So during the session, during this particular session in the fall of 1780, the need once again arose for more Bibles. Robert Atkin, A-I-T-K-E-N, who had set up in Philadelphia as a bookseller and publisher of the Pennsylvania Magazine, saw the need. And he set about quietly to do something about it. In early 1781, he petitioned Congress and received from them the green light to print the Bibles that were needed. The Bible, that book, of all books, came off the press late the next year in 1782 and Congress approved it. This is how the Bible of the Revolution originated. Now it's one of the rarest books in the United States. This particular Bible of 1782 was the first printing on American soil of books. And it was the first printing of the Bible ordered by the Congress of the United States. I want to also show, as we are beginning to come to a conclusion on the, the part one of the Song of Moses, to identify what nation on the face of the earth that this song was for in the 20th century. A Christian nation, 
one that came to a wilderness area, an area that was not inhabited except by wild men, was not. It was a wilderness area. It was a deserted place. And it was given to the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. They had accepted Jesus Christ. He was their Redeemer. It was established for the advancement of the kingdom of God, for the Christian religion. And I want to show you how the very first educational institutions in America were for Christianity. Now, I'm not saying they had very many truths. I'm not saying that they knew the Bible from one end to the other, but they did have a zealous belief in Jesus Christ. And they believed that He shed His blood to purchase them from all of their sins. The university, uh, Harvard University was founded in 1638. It took only 18 years from the time that the pilgrims set foot on Plymouth Rock until the Puritans, who were among the most educated people of their day, founded the first and perhaps most famous Ivy League school. Their story in brief is etched today in the record of Harvard. I quote, After God had carried us safely to New England, and we had built our houses, provided necessities for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship, and settled a civil government, one of the next things we longed for and looked after was to advance learning and perpetuate it to our posterity. Dreading to leave an illiterate ministry to the church when our present ministers shall lie in the dust. End of quote. Harvard College's first presidents and tutors, or teachers, insisted that there could be no true knowledge or wisdom without Jesus Christ. And but for their passionate Christian convictions, there would have been no Harvard University. Harvard's rules and precepts adopted in 1646 included the following essentials. I quote, Everyone shall consider the main end of his life and studies to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. Seeing the Lord gives wisdom, everyone shall seriously, by prayer, in secret, seek wisdom of Him. Everyone shall so exercise himself in reading the Scriptures twice a day that they be ready to give an account of their proficiency therein, both in theoretical observations of languages and logic, and in practical and spiritual truths. End of quote. According to the reliable calculation, 52% of the 17th century Harvard graduates became ministers. Yale University was established in 1701, and by the turn of the century, Christians in the Connecticut region launched Yale as an alternative to Harvard. Many thought that Harvard was too far away and too expensive, and they also observed that the spiritual climate at Harvard was not what it once had been. So now they wanted to establish their own Christian university to train their own ministers. Princeton was founded in 1746. This school, originally called the College of New Jersey, sprang up in part from the impact of the first great awakening, the ministers who were preaching in the great northeast. It also retained its evangelical vigor longer than any other Ivy League school. In fact, Princeton's presidents were evangelical until at least the turn of the 20th century, just about 86 years ago. Dartmouth was established in 1754. A strong missionary thrust launched this school in New Hampshire, and its royal charter signed by King George III of England specified the school's intent to reach the Indian tribes and to educate and Christianize English youth as well. Eliezer Willock, a close friend of evangelist George Whitefield, secured this charter from King George III of England. Columbia, William and Mary, and other Christian colleges in the Northeast were also founded. The first president of New York's Columbia University, first known as King's College, at one time served as a missionary to America under the English-based Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. The Church of England established the College of William and Mary, near today's colonial Williamsburg. And Dutch Reform Revivalists founded Queen's College, which later became Rutgers University. 
in New Jersey. Brown University originated with the Baptist churches scattered along the Atlantic seacoast. With the exception of the University of Pennsylvania, every single collegiate institution founded in the colonies prior to the Revolutionary War in 1861 was established by some branch of the Christian church. Even at Penn, an evangelist played a prominent part when Philadelphia churches denied George Whitefield access to their full pulpits, forcing him to preach out into the open. Some of Whitefield's admirers, among them were Benjamin Franklin, decided to erect a building to accommodate the great crowds that wanted to come hear him. The structure they built became the first building of what is now the University of Pennsylvania, and a statue of Whitefield stands prominently on that campus today. So throughout the Ivy League schools, they were all based upon Christianity. However, all of these schools now have turned to secular colleges. So what I wanted to show today, I believe, has been very clear. We today there have found that there is a nation that was founded in the latter days. And it has, is based upon Christianity. It were the descendants of Joseph whose hands were upheld by the mighty God of Israel. So in part two of this message, I want to go directly into the entire Song of Moses and discover what it says.